Discover the amazing, clinically proven health benefits of Original Tahitian Noni. Original Tahitian Noni includes powerful antioxidants, adaptogens, nutrients, and phytonutrients to naturally boost energy levels, immune system function, and overall health. Meticulously sourced from French Polynesia, this is the original superfruit, except no imitations. Original Tahitian Noni. Visit ATR Health at alchemicaltechrevolution.com and click on the Shop Here tab for more details. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Listening to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McCroy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to discuss what is known in some of the secret society groups as the left emanation. And of course, we'll be hinting at a couple of things here throughout the course of the program tonight that you may pick up on, you may have already picked up on. And a lot of this relates back to. Well, what the secret schools believe is the story of their lineage, because you see, many who belong to the secret schools believe that they are of the bloodline of Cain, and that they bear the special mark of Cain, and they have the divine right to rule over mankind, because they consider themselves semi-divine. So that's what we're going to explore tonight, and we're going to be reading... Once again, from a book we had covered a little bit about previously, called Baphomet, The Temple Mystery Unveiled by Tracy R. Twyman and Alexander Rivera. And we touched on some of this at the end portion of that last episode we did covering this writing, because a lot of this relates to that whole Baphomet idea, which is the inversion principle of the archetype of Pan, if you've been following my work for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. If not, well, you're in for a wild ride tonight. Let's put it that way. But uh, at any rate, we see this whole Baphomet idea is in your face in the modern world. The social engineers of this world have worked hard to conflate this whole archetype into the mainstream as best as possible. And it relates back to many different things. But most people wouldn't make the connection to the bloodline of Cain. But see, that's the thing. Tracy Twyman was very much ahead of her time with this stuff. And she was a very thorough researcher into the occult. And sometimes she got really deep into it. Probably deeper than she should have. And some of the information she came up with as a result of that is intriguing, to say the least. So that's why we're going to touch upon that tonight. And of course, I will add my insights as I usually do in my thoughts and opinions, which I remind you all the time, a lot of this stuff you do have to take with a grain of salt. Because there's no way to really prove nor disprove a lot of this. But use your tools of discernment to figure out for yourself what is true and what is false within the things that are presented, because there's always some kernel of truth and always some bit of value to be garnered from this stuff. And it's, if nothing else, it's valuable to understand what it is that those people who work against you all the time 
what their beliefs are, what their viewpoints are, and the things they do to act upon their beliefs and how they will affect all of us. So understanding their methodology and their reasoning behind the things they do is one of the best things we can do for ourselves so we can understand how better to counter that. So with that being said, we're going to get right into the writing, and some of this will be repeating some of the end portion of the last show we did, touching upon this Baphomet idea. But you'll see, it all ties together, and it's important to review this and go from this point forward. So let's begin. In the book of Genesis, there are a number of mysteries that have always puzzled scholars and vexed religious apologists. One of the most bothersome issues occurs right in the first two chapters. It appears that there are two separate tellings of the creation of the human race. The first version can be found in chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, where on the sixth day of creation, after he created the heavens and the earth, the flora and the fauna, God says, quote, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. End quote. The use of a plural possessive pronoun here by the supposedly singular God is telling and indicates that there was more than one creative being involved. This is another mystery often explained away by Christian apologetics as unimportant, but as we will see, it tends to corroborate the Gnostic or Ophite view of creation being a joint process. And I'm going to pause for a moment right there, folks. And no, this doesn't necessarily mean that. This was Tracy Twyman's interpretation thereof. But I could tell you from years of study into theology, there is another interpretation that could be applied. And yes, there are various different explanations put forward by Christian apologetics and by Christian theologians to explain this, one of which is called Genesis Gap Theory, which does present the idea that perhaps Man was created twice, and m many of the evolutionists, the Darwinian people, have attached that ideology to their way of thinking and use that to justify Christian theological ideas being inherent in our modern-day quote-unquote science. So, with that being the case, you, you have seen... In the past, where a lot of Christians will say, yeah, evolution is a fact. When, if you actually explore the scriptures, it's counterintuitive that to everything we're taught about the creation story. But this is one of the justifications that they use to explain that away. This Genesis gap theory, wherein mankind was created twice. The original beings were perhaps more like animals, didn't really have the divine spark of God, didn't have the image of God at first or the spirit in them, because we'll see when we get a little further here, that in the second telling, God breathes life, the breath of spirit, the breath of life into man, in the second version here. And there's a lot of different explanations that were given for this, but uh, I think the big thing here is the plural possessive pronoun is what stood out to Tracy Twyman, because God said, let us make man in our image. And of course, if you've studied any theological type of things, our image, when he's speaking here, this is the Trinity. So this is the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So speaking in the possessive plural pronoun doesn't necessarily mean that there was more than one creative being involved, if you understand the concept of Trinity. And you could trace this idea of Trinity all the way back through many other cultures as well. It's something that is inherent into the manifestation of form here in this material world in which we live. So it's an explanation provided, and nobody could really say for 100% certain as to the nature 
of how all of these things may have become manifest as they did. But this is the best guide that we have, is the creation story from the Bible. And we have similar creation stories in other mythos and other different systems, religious systems and mythologies all through the ages. So we have to keep these things in mind as we continue on here. But uh, there's always some underlying thought forms that sometimes get misconstrued. And this may be one of them, assuming that there had to be more than one creative being or God to create this whole creation. And that may be a misnomer, or it may not. I mean, I, I totally reserve the right to be wrong about all of it. But uh, in my estimation, there are other ways to explain the use of the plural possessive pronoun here. Uh, so not to get too far off track, we'll go ahead and we'll continue reading because... Uh, Tracy Twyman tended to lean a lot towards Gnostic teachings from what I could see of her research that she had done. And, you know, nothing disparaging to be said there. There's a lot of people that buy into the Gnostic theologies. A lot of people buy into it. I personally find some faults with that way of thinking, but uh, that's my opinion. And everybody has their own opinion, and everybody has their own inherent biases. And Tracy's inherent bias was towards Gnostic ways of thinking. So that's how she presents a lot of her writing here. And there is a lot of logic and reason that can be presented through the way of thinking that she had and is presented here in this book. So it's important that we get that foundational stuff out of the way here as we continue. So let's go ahead and do so. Yet that isn't the only deliberate misinterpretation of the text commonly made by Christian apologetics. A key detail of this first creation story is when the Lord informs the newly created mankind that all vegetation has been created for their consumption, and they are free to eat whatever they want. As we read in verses 29 to 31 of the same chapter, quote, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be, be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. End quote. So it would appear then that God created man on the sixth day. Furthermore, he apparently created man and woman at the same time. It is unspecified whether there is only one human couple created at first or several, but let us just assume there was only one. Why then does God seem to recreate mankind later in chapter 2? That chapter starts out with a description of God resting on the seventh day. Then in verses 4 through 9 of the second chapter, we are told, quote, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. End quote. So then Tracy Twyman goes on here to continue. This is the first mention of the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. A few verses later, in chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, Adam is given charge of tending the garden and also told specifically not to touch the fruit of one of these two trees. Quote, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou wilt shalt surely die. End quote. It is only at this point in verses 18 through 25 in the second version of the story of mankind's creation that the female is mentioned at all. Quote, 
And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And Quote. So in the first creation, man and woman were created at the same time. They were apparently created the same way from the dust of the earth. In the second creation, the man was created first, and then the female was created secondly out of Adam's rib. In the first version, God created man in his own image. In the second creation, God breathes into Adam the breath of life, something not mentioned in the first version. In the first creation, there is no mention of a garden and no mention of forbidden fruit. Rather, mankind is specifically told to eat whatever they want, that all vegetation had been created for that purpose, and it is all good in the Lord's eyes. Perhaps most importantly, since only the creatures of the second creation are given rules to follow, only they can transgress those rules. The first mankind is blessed and told to be fruitful and multiply. It is only the second mankind that experiences the fall from grace after eating from the tree of knowledge. And it is only after this that they begin to breed, seemingly as a result of the sexual awareness that they gain after the fall. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. And now we're going to get into some of the rabbinical teachings about this. Some of the things that go back to the Zohar and go back to Kabbalistic traditions. And we'll see these are the things that are largely taught throughout the secret society groups. These are the things that they believe and that they act upon. So it's important to understand where much of this comes from. And we're going to get into that, and then we're going to connect some dots for you that you probably haven't connected before. And this is important information. So let's keep that in mind as we continue on. Because if you want to understand the people who run this place in which we exist, you need to understand what they believe and what they see as foundational to their belief systems. And these things, they act upon them. And they treat them as if it's a reality. So even if you think it's total nonsense, to them, they treat it as if it's their reality. And they act upon it as if it's their reality. And the things they do to act upon their beliefs, therefore, will affect all of us. Because they have positioned themselves into very prominent places of power in this world. And they have a ton of influence on mankind at large. So let's read on. And we'll get into a little bit of the theology and the philosophy around this and the rabbinical traditions. The rabbinical school, known as the Pharisees, believed that the first creation was of Adam Kadmon, the perfect primordial man, a mirror image of the divine logos, or the word, and a hermaphroditic being. Philo wrote that Adam Kadmon, whom he also called heavenly man or original man, was born in the image of God with no participation in any corruptible or earth-like essence, whereas the earthly man is made of loose material called a lump of clay. The second creation they teach was when the female half was split apart from the whole to become Adam and Eve. The Pharisees thought that the primordial Adam was created and destroyed prior to the actual creation of the universe. The Kabbalistic text known as the Zohar says that within his body were contained all of the elements of creation. That text even indicates that God patterned existence after the image of Adam Kadmon, and that perhaps God himself was made in Adam's image, not the other way around. Or perhaps Adam Kadmon is God, in this view, and the creator of Adam and Eve. As the Zohar says, quote, The form of man is the image of everything that is above and below. Therefore did the holy ancient select it for his own form, end quote. This seems to agree with the Apostle Paul, with what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 47. Quote, and it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. 
the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, end quote. Paul referred to Adam Cadmon as the second man because he thought that, although he was conceived as a spirit prior to the creation of the earthly Adam, he wasn't created in the flesh until afterwards. This is because Paul believed that Adam Cadmon incarnated for the first time as Jesus Christ. In a similar vein, members of the Judeo-Christian Gnostic sect known as the El- Alchesicites believed that when Adam Cadmon split in two, the male side became the Messiah and the female part the Holy Ghost. This may all be a bit confusing, however, the most important points for our inquiry are these, that number one, there were forms, primordial entities, and events that took place between them prior to what we consider the actual creation of our present universe. Number two, these primordial entities were hermaphroditic and split apart into male and female entities during creation. And number three, creation was a fall from the perfection of the prior state. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So we're getting on some pretty hefty ideas right here. So first and foremost, many of the Kabbalists and the old teachers of the rabbinic ways of the Zohar They claim that Adam Kadmon was created first, and this was the perfection. And when the physical world was made, the world in which we live, Adam Kadmon split apart his male and female components and became male and female here. And we had these attributes separated here. And that... This manifestation was representative of God, and God took the form of man, and man took the form of God. I know it gets a little bit confusing, but the the original teaching is that when mankind was first created, he was hermaphroditic, and this goes back through the teachings of a lot of these different mystery schools and secret teachings going all the way back, the hermaphroditic expression. So they claim man had both of the masculine and the the feminine attributes in his nature inherently, but it's only by splitting these apart that he was able to reproduce in a physical sense here. And a lot of the things that they teach, the philosophies in these secret schools, is all about reuniting these two forces, the masculine and the feminine, together back into unity to achieve the perfection of that golden age when man was untainted, when there was no fall, if you would like to call it that. But this also ties to the ideas inherent in the symbol that is Baphomet, And this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. And we'll see, as we continue reading here, what other things, information, and beliefs have cropped up in the secret schools surrounding this context of things. So let's read on. Herein lies the key to our investigation about Baphomet. To hear many Kabbalists tell it, the first pair was not Adam and Eve, but rather Adam and Lilith. The story of Lilith is an epic saga all its own, and it all takes place prior to the events of Genesis, in a time before time, in what is referred to in Yiddish as Yenivolt, the other world. Lilith's name means spirit of night which is undoubtedly connected to the darkness of the great supernal abyss, the nothingness prior to creation, out of which she is said to have sprung spontaneously. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Now, this is beginning to sound very much like things taught in Thelema, Crowley's system. Also, it sounds a lot like things taught in fiction, fiction, like the works 
of various authors out there. You know, you've heard the stories about Cthulhu and the Great Old Ones, the Ancient Ones. Lovecraft. All of these Lovecraftian ideas are based upon this, too. And here's a little side note about that. I haven't really explored this to any real depth. But it has been said by some researchers that Lovecraft was inspired by one of his relatives, I believe it was either his grandfather or his uncle or some such thing, who had many books from the secret societies sitting around because he was a member of the Freemasonic fraternities and he was a high-ranking member that undertook the rites of Memphis and Misrium in the Freemasonic system, which are very occultic rites. And he had some old writings about that sitting around. And this is one of the things that inspired Lovecraft's writing. I haven't fully explored this to its depths, but you see how a lot of these ideas tie over into the occult teachings and the secret society groups. So a lot of the things Lovecraft allegedly came up with are based upon what they believe to be true ideas. And here's the rub with all of this, okay? Even if it is total fiction and it's not true at all, this creates a situation in which if you explore the thoughts of magical teachings, it creates what's known as an egregore or a tulpa. So when you put this thing out there and enough people buy into it and think that there's something real behind it, it creates a sort of energetic pattern that begins to emerge and begins to take on a sort of life of its own. We've seen this before with a lot of different things, even in the modern era. So with that being said, you have mo more modern people like uh, a gentleman named Jordy Rose, who used to be the CEO for a company that developed quantum computers called D-Wave. And in on film, he's, he's quoted as saying this, that uh, he thinks that uh, it's kind of like the, the development of artificial intelligence using quantum computers is kind of like, quote-unquote, summoning the demon, and he compares it back to some Lovecraftian ideas. So you have people in the modern era on record giving feasance to this energetic principle in a lot of ways. So whether it, there's anything true or not behind it, the idea is out there and it hits on some type of archetypal thinking in the human psyche. And in so doing, it creates a response, an energetic response in the world. And oftentimes we can see a manifestation of some such thing occur because it has to do with the human mind. So keep in mind, even if you think this stuff's nonsense, there's people out there in these secret society groups and in high power positions in this world that believe in these things and act upon them and they give a type of how should we say a type of life to these ideas and these principles due to their actions so we see here Lilith allegedly sprung spontaneously out of the supernal abyss this primordial nothingness and mated with Adam, the first man. And this was the first pairing. Let's continue on, because I'll tell you here, in their own words, what they say about this. But let's, let's read in the book here. Lilith and Adam allegedly quarreled over sex, specifically about who would be on top. When Adam insisted on being on top, Lilith left him. She is said to have disappeared from paradise by pronouncing the secret and sacred name of God, also known as the Tetragrammaton in Kabbalistic lore, which bestows godlike power on those who can speak it. Some legends even state that she obtained the divine name from God himself by seducing him. According to one version of the story, upon speaking the name, she shapeshifted into an owl and flew away to the Red Sea, which, according to legend, has never, or sorry, has been her abode ever since. The Red Sea. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So she shapeshifted into an owl, and you can see some crossovers to some other various stories here, if you want to look at that. Who else shapeshifted into an owl? 
Well, Isis. Do you begin to see some of the connections? I mean, this is the archetype at play here. So this Lilith archetype is comparative to the Isis archetype of the Egyptian mythos. So keep that in mind. A lot of these things, they cross the bounds of time and culture in the various mythologies. And we see this across the board. Different mythologies, they, they give different names to these same inherent principles here. So this is the case with this as well. And we could attach those layers of meaning to this as well. Let's go ahead and continue on because it gets more interesting from here. Nocturnal emissions were believed by Jews to be evidence that the man had been visited by Lilith in the form of a succubus. It is said that she is cursed to have to give birth to children continuously, but that they are malformed half-demons who die at birth. As a way of getting revenge for that against the sons of Adam, they said that Lilith also visited infant boys in their sleep to suffocate them. Thus, every instance of the mysterious malady known as crib death, which affects mostly boys, was attributed to Lilith, and superstitious Jews would leave medical amulets on the walls of their children's bedrooms to ward off these attacks. The word lullaby is believed to derive from the incantations that Jews would sometimes say over the children while putting them to bed, again to protect them from Lilith. This is also the origin of the Jewish and European custom of letting boys grow their hair long until age three, to trick Lilith into thinking that they are girls. Some even dressed their sons in girls' clothes during this vulnerable period in their lives. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So are you beginning to connect some other dots with things going on in modern society, once again here, with some of this? So we can see... Ideas like crib death and uh, the killing of infants as a type of revenge against the sons of Adam. It's a motif here. We can see the idea of gender confusion to ward off the spirit of Lilith taking center stage here in the youth. So what exactly... What exactly are these dark occultists who run things trying to manifest here today? Why do you think in society today we have things like, oh, I don't know, drag queen shows for young children? Why? Why? Why do you think we have abortions? Do you think it has something to do with this primordial Willith archetype? This Isis archetype? Maybe it does. Let's continue reading. Amazingly, Lilith is not just a figure in Jewish Kabbalistic demonology, but appears in the mythologies of other cultures as well. In ancient Sumer, she was called Lilithu, which means Queen of the Night and they believed that she preyed upon people during their sleep, just like the Jews did. She was called by the Babylonians Lamashtu, meaning the daughter of heaven. Lamashtu was known for strangling babies and drinking their blood. Can I pause for a moment here, folks? You've heard of adrenochrome, right? Well, where do you think they got that idea from? Of course, this stuff has ties back to occultism and to mythologies. Of course it does. Now, is adrenochrome a real thing? It is a real chemical. I don't know about its attributes as far as these, uh, you know, elites allegedly drinking blood and stuff like that to maintain their youth. They have certainly been caught drinking blood or consuming blood of others or taking blood transfusions to maintain their youth. This is a known commodity. But this idea of adrenochrome, I think, is to throw us off the mark. But there may be some notion to the whole idea here of the blood of the young to restore youthfulness to people. And perhaps this is where they got some of that ideology from, the archetype inherent here. The Lilith archetype 
it underlies a lot of different things. Most people don't realize it, wouldn't recognize it, especially in the modern era. You've probably heard of it. You've probably heard this idea of Lilith. You've probably heard the name and make the loose association with, you know, perhaps demonic things or some such thing. Uh, there, there's even uh, rock festivals and stuff that celebrate Lilith. Lilith Fair, is that what it's called? Um, we see a lot of this stuff. The, the archetype is out there and ever-present. And a lot of people don't understand what really lies behind that archetype. They see it as an archetype of rebellion, of female empowerment, and that's not the case at all when it gets down to brass tacks with this stuff. But uh, we'll go ahead. Let's continue reading here. In ancient Greece, she was called Lamia and was said to have had an affair with Zeus. In his jealousy, Zeus's what or in jealousy, excuse me, in jealousy, Zeus's wife Hera killed all of their children. So in retaliation, Lamia began to kidnap and murder human babies. This is similar to the Jewish Lilith's motivation to kill infants. However, the real reason why Lilith desires the sons of Adam as sexual partners is actually because Adam wasn't her first consort. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. Pay close attention now. Because this is where the rubber meets the road with the things that the secret schools believe. And this is one of the archetypes that underlies everything they do. Let's continue on. I'll start that sentence over again. However, the real reason why Lilith desires the sons of Adam as sexual partners is actually because Adam wasn't her first consort or the lover whom she is truly pining after. In fact, rabbinical sources maintain that the first hermaphroditic pair was not Lilith and Adam, but Lilith and the demon Samael. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. There's also variations on this theme where Samael also was the partner with Eve, her first partner, and that they bore her a son, and his name was Cain, that Samael fathered Cain through Eve. Now, this is a slightly very varied story from the other one because they're claiming Lilith and Samael were partners first. You see, so there's some variations in the theme here, but this is taught in a lot of the different secret schools. They teach that this Samael was the father of Cain, not Adam. So we see here, it gets a little confused in some of the retellings from the different sources but let's go with what is said here. The, the whole point is that these non-human beings had sexual relations with human beings and produced offspring. That's the whole notion going on here. So therefore creating what can be considered a semi-divine bloodline of sorts. But let's continue on. So we see here... I'll repeat that last sentence and we'll go from there. In fact, rabbinical sources maintain that the first hermaphroditic pair was not Lilith and Adam, but Lilith and the demon Samael. The creature that they formed together was a monstrous serpent, apparently equivalent to the one that later attempted Adam and Eve in the garden. The Kabbalists called this Lilith Samael creature the beast and the other god. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So what they're saying is this Lilith was only the feminine aspect of this creature, this Samael Lilith creature, that this was the primordial hermaphroditic creation, that these two predated Adam and Eve, and we just talked about how Adam and Eve in the garden, how Eve was taken from Adam, and that this is where they contend that the separation of the male from the female, the masculine from the feminine, in the material world began. Well, 
and they claim preeminently before that that man was hermaphroditic. Well, we also have these beasts that were hermaphroditic that pre-existed before mankind was formed, and that this Lilith Samael creature was separated also at that same point into its masculine and feminine forms, and that those beings or those aspects of that being intermated with humanity and created this semi-divine bloodline. That's what's being revealed here. And that this is called the beast or the other god by the Kabbalists. The beast. Have you heard mention of the beast in the book of Revelation? The mark of the beast. What's the mark of the beast? The other god, as called by the Kabbalists here and by the rabbinical sources. Let's continue reading. So it says in parentheses here after this last sentence, and I'll repeat that sentence. A lot of this is important stuff to keep in mind. Maybe shocking for some people to hear, but this is what they believe in the secret schools. This is what's taught. And perhaps we may have some kernel of truth attached to these ideas to one in one way, shape, or form. But you do have to take it with a grain of salt. But this is what they teach. This is what's taught in the Kabbalistic traditions. Let's repeat that last sentence and continue from there. The Kabbalist called this Lilith Samael creature the beast and the other god. And then it says in parentheses here, This is especially interesting because, as we will soon discuss, some Gnostics referred to the Demiurge, who they believed had created physical reality by the name of Samael also. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So, whatever your thoughts are on Gnosticism, you can keep that in mind. Put that in the back of your mind that they called this Demiurge Samael. And they're making this connection here in this way. Let's read on. It is clear from the Kabbalist text that they saw this Lilith Samael monster as the serpent that tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They even saw it as the father of Eve's son Cain. Treatise on the left emanation by R. Isaac B. Jacob Ha Cohen and T. R. Ronald C. Kiner describes Samael as evil but specifies that this is, quote, not because of his nature, but because he desires to unite and intimately mingle with an emanation not of his nature. End quote. A sigil or a magical insignia designed for Baphomet by 19th century occultist Stanislaus de Gaeta includes the names of the demons Samael and Lilith. The opposite side of this sigil shows the figure of a man with the names Adam and Eve written around it. We read in Treatise on the Left Emanation that, quote, In this tradition, it is made clear that Samael and Lilith were born as one, similar to the form of Adam and Eve, who were also born as one, reflecting what is above, end quote. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So once again, we see the designation being made here, and this is what they teach in the secret schools, that when mankind was first created, he was a dual-sexed being. He was hermaphroditic. He had both the aspects of the male and the female inherent in him. But in order to reproduce or to create in this material reality, these aspects of being had to be separated. They had to be separated. And this is also said of the serpent in the garden who is identified here in the old tradition of the Zohar and the Kabbalists as this Samael, Willith being, the serpent. There's also, in many of the old mythological traditions, what they call Nagas, the Nagas, which were serpent beings, 
similarly described here, and many have speculated that this is indeed the serpent from the Garden of Eden that tempted Adam and Eve, and we see this here. This is what they teach in some of the secret schools. Like I said, take it with a grain of salt. Make of it what you will. Use your discernment. Determine for yourself. This is information. It's valuable information to know. Because this is truly what the dark occultists at the top of the power structure of this world believe and act upon. So knowing that, you understand why they feel the way they do about things. Why they act in the ways they act. And we'll get a little bit more into that. We've we got to get uh, some more down the road here. There's still a lot more to cover. But uh, at any rate, let's go ahead and continue reading. In this instance, the text seems to be saying that Adam Cadmon, the Adam-Eve hermaphrodite being, cast a reflection, or perhaps more appropriately, a shadow, that created the monstrous hermaphrodite entity of Lilith Samael. However, while the human pair are described as above, and therefore presumably superior to, the serpent pair, Kabbalistic writings suggest that the serpents represent something older and more primordial, as the abyss, and it says in parentheses, nothingness or chaos, that they come from is considered older than creation. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Ordo ab chao, order out of chaos. We've discussed here on this program before, that those people in the secret schools, they believe that everything was extant, this universe was extant before physical manifestation came about here, before there was form, there was this chaos, this void, this vast nothingness that was here, and that the great architect of the universe made order out of that chaos. And of course, when they refer to the great architect of the universe, they're not referring to God, the creator, as we would understand or think about that. They're referring to Lucifer. This is inherent in all the secret schools. But uh, at any rate, not to get sidetracked by that, but you see how it harkens back on these same ideas and the as above, so below. The idea of the reflection, the reflection, as in a mirror darkly, the shadow, the negation principle, the negrito, if you want to get to the alchemical term. So that's what the claim is here. But that the absence or the negrito factor is older than the rest. That's also what's being claimed here. Predates manifestation. But see, that's the other thing. How would you say that something predates manifestation, because if there is nothingness, then that means time is not a thing either. And our perception of time is not a thing. It's hard to imagine nothingness. It's impossible. We can't comprehend the idea of nothingness or the absence of everything. It's not within our capacity to do so. It's the negation principle at its primest form. It's purest form. But uh, at any rate, let's go ahead and continue on. I don't want to get sidetracked with a lot of these other types of thoughts, but uh, just wanted to point that out. It appears that the fathers of Western occultism were well aware of the legends about Lilith and Samael. Why else would their names have been included on de Goethe's Baphomet sigil, particularly with the names of Adam and Eve included on the other side of the sigil? We also can presume that it is these two snakes who are being represented by the Caduceus staff, that a life as Levi depicted rising from Baphomet's crotch region, the Caduceus, the ancient symbol of a pole and coiled with two snakes, has been connected not only to Hermes and alchemy, both things associated with Baphomet, but also with the image of a crucified serpent and of the snake coiled around the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. Now we know why. The fact that the Baphomet sigil is also presented frequently with the word Leviathan indicates that some occultists have been aware that this is also another name for the same figure. Leviathan, described in the Old Testament as a giant sea dragon capable of encircling the earth, is said to be either female or part of a hermaphroditic beast, just like Lilith and Samael. 
Sometimes Leviathan's male counterpart is said to be Behemoth, a land beast. Sometimes the pair is just referred to in the plural as the Leviathans. going to pause for a moment here, folks. So this opens up whole new avenues of thought as well. We have these connections in the Bible. We have these connections in other mythologies. We have these stories about these serpent beings. These reptilian beings circulate today in modern mythologies. And of course, the modern mythologies I'm speaking of, this would be ufology. The UFO movement. The reptilian idea. Where do you think this came from? Of course it came from old occultism. Of course it did. All roads always lead back to these same places. We have a habit of saying all roads lead to Rome. But if you go back to even before Rome, you find the occult interwoven with all of this. This is where this comes from. It's something primal and archetypal in the psyche of mankind. The serpent, the reptilian, leviathan, behemoth, one being the feminine aspect, one being the masculine aspect, one representing water, the other representing earth, the old philosophical elements presented herein, the beast, behemoth, we have all these different legends attached to this, and they've all been brought forward and modernized for our modern sensibilities within the study of ufology and the UFO movement. It's a modern mythology, folks. They even speak about things like uh, Earth was created by the collision of two planets, and they'll invoke the name Tiamat in that, calling one of the planets Tiamat. And that's where the water and stuff came from. Do you, do you see how it all ties together in all of these occult teachings? All the same thing. So Leviathan, Lilith, Tiamat, Isis, all the same archetype presented in different ways through time and culture. The elements, the elemental ideas, the basic elemental principles... These foundational truths of manifestation here in this material reality that we experience. But there's things that underlie that. Primal things that we have a hard time really pointing a finger at, but we understand the archetype. Anyway, let's continue reading here. Very similar things are said about Leviathan and her consort as are said about Lilith and Samael. They are clearly just different names for the same figures. In both cases, it is said that they were once together physically, but that God separated them because the act of their mating was somehow dangerous to the well-being of the universe. So in both cases, they were cleaved apart, castrating the male and preventing them from ever uniting sexually again. With both sets of characters, it is written that if they ever come together again, all of existence will somehow be annihilated. In the case of the Leviathans, it is said numerous times in the Bible that at the end of times God will slaughter them and feed their flesh to the righteous among men. This will take place at a feast with the Messiah in the New Jerusalem, inside a tent made from the monster's skin. This is what the Jewish festival known as the Feast of Tabernacles is meant to celebrate, and it is probably why the early Christians adopted the fish as their symbol. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. I don't know if I could attest to the truth of these statements or not. I don't know. Use your discernment. Do you think that's the true nature of these things? Do you think that's part and parcel? of what the Feast of Tabernacles is about? I would be hard-pressed to say for certain. But going by this line of thinking, you could understand something more about what these people in positions of power in this world believe and how they think of these things. Let's continue on. Because Samael and Lilith 
a.k.a. Leviathan and Behemoth, are constantly longing for each other, they found a way to mate via an intermediary called Tenon Ivor, or the Blind Dragon, or the Groomsman. We read about it in Treatise on the Left Emanation, quote, You already know that evil Samael and wicked Lilith are like a sexual pair who, by means of an intermediary, receive an evil and wicked emanation from one and emanate to the other. The heavenly serpent is a blind prince, the image of an intermediary between Samael and Lilith. Its name is Tananiver. The masters of tradition said that just as the serpent slithers without eyes, so the supernal serpent has the image of a spiritual form without color. These are the eyes. The traditionists call it an eyeless creature. Therefore, its name is Tannen Ivor. He is the bond, the accompaniment, and the union between Samael and Lilith. If he were created whole in the fullness of his emanation, he would have destroyed the world in an instant. Now this is getting really kinky. This Tannen Ivor is a slithering serpent without eyes who somehow enables the castrated Samael to have sex with Lilith. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Once again, once again, we have the connection here made to the idea of Isis and Osiris, once again. At any rate, we see here, the claim is that if he were fully to manifest, then the destruction of the universe, which happens whenever these two truly mate, would come about anyway. So whatever Tan and Ivor does for them... It has the capability of being just as good as the real thing. But mercifully, right now, it is not, or else we would all be dead. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So we see here this idea of the intermediary. And this has been, this has been hinted on, if you do any study into what's called demonology as well, the idea of the succubus or the incubus, how they, they take emanations from human beings and use them in this way this is be this would be where those types of stories derive from from this whole principle right here let's continue reading and we'll wrap it up here in uh, just a little bit more detail on this subject comes from the zohar where the intermediary is described as none other than Azazel, the goat demon who figures so prominently in the Old Testament, as we will explain shortly. Now observe a deep and holy mystery of faith, the symbolism of the male principle and the female principle of the universe. There is the line where the male and female principles join, forming together the rider on the serpent, and symbolized by Azazel. So here, the tannin ivor is likened to a line that unites the two creatures and is said to be riding them and to be symbolized by the goat demon Azazel. Another passage from the Zohar goes on further with the same language. The unholy filth grasps the male above and the female below. Here, male and female join together. They are the rider on the serpent. This is the secret of Azazel, which includes the male and female of defilement. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So we see these ideas inherent of the incubus, the succubus. This has all been attached to this Lilith, Samael idea. The Leviathan, the behemoth. You see, you have these, these consistent pairs through the different theologies, different philosophies different mythologies, different systems here, all connected by the serpent, the hermaphroditic serpent. And a lot of it has to do with the sex force. Of course, that's what it's all about, the sex force. That is the creative force, the force, as they like to call it. The force. And there's a masculine side and a feminine side. There's a light side and a dark side. Goes way beyond Star Wars, folks. <laughs> the Force. But at any rate, let's continue on. 
The exact same role, riding shotgun in between a male-female pair that were formerly one hermaphroditic creature, was played by Azazel in another sacred text as well, the Slavonic pseudopigraphal Apocalypse of Abraham. Here he is described doing this with Adam and Eve. A vision is related of Adam and Eve standing under the tree of knowledge, entwined with each other physically, and with Azazel between them, feeding them both grapes. In his book, Dark Mirrors, Azazel and Satanael in Early Jewish Demonology, Andre A. Orlov compares this to a sexual menage a trois and suggests that it may be an allusion to the first couple being ridden via demonic possession. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. Demonic possession, or this third pillar in between the other two pillars if you want to think of it in that regard too so you see the symbolism inherent in all the secret society groups about all of this stuff as well so the idea of the serpent and of course you have that whole notion of the serpent force as they like to call it sometimes or they also call it not just the serpent force it's known by many other names as well so we've covered this in the past they claim that this is the the fluids the the spinal fluids going up and down the spinal column as well so the spine the spinal column would be an equivalence of this third pillar this a representation of this this third party between the male and female aspects. Do you see how they tie it back to anatomy and everything else? If, if you begin to pick up some of these connections with this and see these different things, you can understand what's being said here. So they refer to this also as the Kundalini, which is also represented by the serpent or the serpent force. Do you understand how deep a lot of this stuff goes? How deep-rooted it is? How much of an archetypal idea that it is and we could trace it back to these stories and this makes it abundantly clear when you begin to look back at the old old Kabbalistic traditions like this so let's read on and we'll wrap it up here very soon is this then what the work of the tannin Ivor really entails is his function to facilitate the possession of human bodies by demons so that the spirits can hook up with each other sexually? Couldn't it be that Baphomet is the tannin Ivor, the Azazel that joins the serpent? Isn't he then like the philosophical Mercury, the Azoth of the alchemists, which they said could bind any chemical marriage no matter how unlikely? The product of alchemical marriage has always been represented as a Frankenstein chimera monstrosity like Baphomet, composed of many different types of animals and people. But we must wonder, is that the ultimate chemical wedding? Is between angels or spirits and men, like what the Kabbalists seem to be saying has happened between Adam, Eve, Samael, and Lilith? In addition to being the primordial sex goddess, Lilith is a path to divine wisdom, the forbidden wisdom of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which, according to Genesis, opens the eyes of a person and allows them to see things like God does. The 13th century Spanish Kabbalist R. Isaac Hockahen said that Lilith is, quote, a ladder on which one can ascend the two rungs of prophecy and Quote. Similarly, we read in Left Emanation, quote, Concerning this point, there is a received tradition from the ancient sages who made use of the secret knowledge of the lesser palaces, which is the manipulation of demons and a ladder by which one ascends to the prophetic levels, end quote. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks, and point out the notion of ladders being another important symbol to not only the Freemasons, but all of the secret schools, and also tied, of course, to religious traditions, Jacob's Ladder, anyone? Uh, also attached to the scientific 
modern day, a Jacob's Ladder. It's an electrical device where it creates the spark gap, and you can watch the spark jump across the gap and move up the two poles, between the two poles, a Jacob's Ladder. But let's continue on. There are many other parallels as well between the Kabbalistic legends of Lilith Samael in the Garden of Eden and the creation stories of the Gnostics. Gnostic cosmology describes creation as happening in a series of eons, just as in Genesis it happens over a period of days. However, the word eon not only means a lengthy span of time, but can also be thought of as a universe unto itself, with a living intelligence of its own, too. Each eon is generated by a syzygy, a hermaphroditic male-female pair of intelligences. In the beginning, all of the primordial intelligences were together inside uncreated totality, which was called the pleroma. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So you may recognize some Greek philosophy tied together with this as well. So these are stories of universes past or worlds past. And like I said, a lot of this stuff you do have to take with a grain of salt because there is no way to prove nor disprove any of this. How would you prove that a prior universe existed with a, a different god being having created it and the whole thing existed and had manifest and now has passed on and we are within one of these? How would you prove that? There's no way. So that being said, it is a... An interesting way of thinking, but also at the same token, you do have to take a step back and use a little bit of discernment here with some of these things. But we see here, each eon, it says, is generated by a syzygy, a hermaphroditic male-female pair of intelligences. And you know where else teaches this very same philosophy? Mormonism teaches the same thing, that uh, when you pass on, if you were a good Mormon here, then you can pass on and become a spirit father or spirit mother of a planet of your own. I'm not kidding. You can look that up. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is what they believe and what's taught in the highest ranks of Mormonism. I would recommend a good book by one Mr. Ed Decker, um, I'm trying to think of what the title of it is that talks about Mormonism. Uh, but uh, at any rate, it's a lot of the same things inherent there. A lot of the same things inherent there in Mormonism that are taught in the secret schools. They teach these very similar ideas, you see. And all of this stuff came from these same places within the occult fraternities. So... Anyway, let's go ahead and continue on. However, just as Lilith wanted to be on top of Adam sexually, Sophia refused to submit to the dominance of a sexual partner. Instead, she tried to generate an eon parthenogenically on her own. The result was a deformity, an abortion that was cast outside of the pleroma because of its hideousness, like a teen mother might discard her baby in a trash can or toilet. As the story goes, after Sophia's abortion, the real father of all made a new pair called Christos Holy Spirit to clean up the mess that had been made outside of the Pleroma. He then created a new, unpaired eon named Jesus, and he formed the abortion into the new entity, Sophia Akamoth, the lesser Sophia. Her name is related to the Hebrew word for wisdom, Hokmah. Her pain at being separated from the pleroma actually became the substance that Jesus then used, according to the Gnostics, to form the physical matter of the cosmos. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So now you're beginning to see what it is that the Gnostics teach. Does this sound anything like what you would attach to some type of narrative of truth? First of all, how would they know this? How would they be able to make these connections and verify these things? These ideas? 
How do you know if there was a previous universe, what, anything about it? Think about that. We don't even know much of anything about the world or universe in which we live now. How would we know all of this about some previous existent universe? It doesn't stand up to scrutiny or logic in any way, shape, or form. But this is what they're taught in these secret schools, and they view this as being the secret knowledge, the secret teachings, the wisdom of the ages. So you see here, the story goes that Sophia, Sophia's abortion, that's all we are. And then you understand why these people have their viewpoint of humanity that they do. The lesser Sophia. Let's continue reading, though. You can't make this stuff up, folks. This is what they really teach and believe at the highest, most levels of these secret society groups. This is the stuff they teach. This is what the Gnostics teach. So think about that. Think about that. So let's continue on here. So we just said that... Uh, he then created a new, unpaired eon named Jesus, and he formed the abortion into the new entity, Sophia Akamoth, the lesser Sophia. Her name is related to the Hebrew word for wisdom, Hokma. Her pain at being separated from the Pleroma actually became the substance that Jesus then used, according to the Gnostics, to form the physical matter of the cosmos. Akamoth then created the Demiurge out of that and made him king of everything outside of the Pleroma, as well as the chief artificer in charge of rearranging matter. Then the Demiurge created the seven heavens below him, each with a god in charge of it. These seem to correspond with the planetary intelligences. Note that in this case, just as in Judaism, the fall from perfection is caused by knowledge, which the Kabbalists say created a false universe of shells represented by the infernal Klefoth tree. In Gnosticism, the fall is caused by wisdom, or Sophia, giving birth to a malformed creation. Sophia's abortion can be thought of as a parallel to the fact that, after being cast out, of the Garden of Eden, Lilith was cursed to continue giving birth to demonic children, with no father apparently, who would die as soon as they were born. Lilith is described in the Zohar as a husk covering divine light, just as Gnostics said we are divine light trapped inside husks, our physical bodies. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Are you picking up the connotations being made herein now? Just as the Gnostics had stories about Sophia and the Eons, Kabbalists have stories about hermaphroditic beings, Lilith Samael and Adam Kadmon, that personified primordial forces existing in a nether world of chaos prior to the present creation. The Kabbalists infer that the fall occurred when the first male-female pair was split apart. The Gnostics said it was when the female Sophia tried to be independent without her male half. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Do we see reflections of this feminist-type push today? Did you ever wonder what militant feminism is about? Do you ever wonder what the end result is? Ever wonder about that? Well, of course it ties back to these mythological archetypes. Of course it does. It always does. And, and that's the thing that has always stunned me about this. The more I've researched and the more I've looked into what you would call these conspiracy-type topics, the more shocking it is that it always ties back to these same places. It always has its roots in the occult and in these ancient mystery schools and the things they teach, and it all has this archetypal representation attached to it. And it doesn't matter what it is across the board, it always ties back to this. Always. It's stunning. It truly is. But let's continue on. In Mesopotamia, Lilith's companion was the Screech Owl. 
In the Old Testament, references to this animal were used to denote Lilith. Note that owls are seen as symbols of wisdom in the West, as an owl was the sidekick of the wisdom goddess Minerva, or Athena to the Romans. You may recall that Minerva sprang spontaneously from the head of Zeus, just as Lilith is said to have randomly popped into existence from the great supernal abyss. So Zeus fathered Minerva without a mate, just like Sophia created the Demiurge in the same manner. So you see here, folks, the same archetypal representations are present through all mythology. Through all mythology, we have these same tropes turning up over and over again, just by different names. Let's continue on, and we're going to wrap up in the next couple of minutes here. The legend of Lilith becomes even more complex when we learn that, according to the Kabbalistic texts, there are, in fact, two Liliths. Lilith the matron and Lilith the maiden. The latter is described as the slave or handmaiden of the former. Lilith, the matron, is said to be both the mate of Samael and of God himself, seemingly the same as the Jewish concept of the Shekinah, or matronate, as the bride of God. It also seems analogous to the idea of Sophia as the bride of Jesus that some Gnostics adhered to. Lilith, the maiden, comes across as her dark doppelganger, and also subordinate, just like the relationship between Sophia and Sophia Akamoth in the Gnostic system. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks, and you might recognize this same type of relationship in what we would call the human double, the doppelganger, or the aramonic double, of which we've discussed in the past here. These same tropes over and over again, same frameworks upon which all these philosophies are built, and a lot of these ideas are tied directly into Gnosticism or come from Gnosticism. The Gnostics, they carried on the traditions of the ancient mystery schools. They were a mystery school unto themselves, but they attached themselves to Christian fundamentals and therefore get misconstrued by many people as being Christian mysticism, when in fact Gnosticism and Christian mysticism, although they may be related in some ways, are not the same thing. And oftentimes they overlap in many ways. But at any rate, we could understand a little something here. It all ties back to these same ideas way back in the past. Let's continue on and we'll wrap it up. Another Jewish legend that seems to be connected with these concepts asserts that the Shekinah was for a time exiled while a slave woman, her handmaiden, took her place. The handmaiden appears to be equated with the Egyptian kingly line. The Zohar, as quoted by Alan Hum in his online article, Lilith in Kabbalah Zohar, tells us, quote, one day the companions were walking with Rabbi Shim or Bar Yohi. Rabbi Shim on said, We shall see that all these nations have risen and Israel is lower than all of them. Why is this? Because the king sent away the matronet from him and took the slave woman in her place. Who is this slave woman? The alien crown whose firstborn, the holy one, blessed be he, killed in Egypt. At first, she sat behind the hand mill, and now this slave woman inherited the place of her mistress. And Rabbi Shimon wept and said, The king without the matronette is not called king. The king who adhered to the slave woman, to the handmaid of the matronette, where is his honor? He lost the matronette and attached himself to the place which is called slave woman. This slave woman was destined to rule over the holy land of below, as the matronette formerly ruled over it. But the Holy One, blessed be he, will ultimately bring back the matronette to her place as before. And then what will be the rejoicing? Say the rejoicing of the king and the rejoicing of the matronette. The rejoicing of the king because he will return to her and separate from the slave woman. And rejoicing of the matronette because she will return to the couple with the king. End quote. So I'm going to pause right there. And this also has many similarities to the story of Abraham. 
Abraham, the matronette, that would be Sarah in the story of Abraham, if you're familiar with the, the Bible story. Well, if you're not, I'll, I'll give you a brief explanation here. Abraham, Abraham and Sarah, they were promised that they would have a child, and Abraham would be the father of many nations. And they grew very old and still didn't have children as promised by God, so Abraham took it upon himself to have relations with one of his slave women named Hagar and birthed his son Isaac. And then later, his true wife, the matronette, Sarah, became pregnant. Well, actually, I got that wrong. Hagar begat Ishmael, and then Sarah begat Isaac. So we have these same similar stories here. Uh, so, oh, and actually, now that I just took a moment to read a little further down the page, she actually mentions that. So I'm going to read on. Maybe I should just pay attention to what I'm reading rather than side trailing so much. Let's continue. Occult writers Nigel Jackson and Michael Howard in their book The Pillars of Tubal Cain equate the slave woman mentioned here with Lilith. The metaphor is commonly thought to refer to the time of destruction of the Temple of Solomon and the exile of the Israelites to Babylon in the 6th century BC. But why, then, the reference to the Egyptian slave woman? Although it was the Hebrews who were at one point the slaves of the Egyptians, several Egyptian women are depicted as slaves to important Old Testament figures, including Hagar, Abraham's slave and the mother of his disowned son Ishmael. Interestingly, Hagar was said by Kabbalists, to resemble Lilith. Hagar and Ishmael were exiled to the desert to die of thirst after Abraham's wife Sarah became jealous of them. God miraculously saved them. This story of a slave woman as the mistress of the matron's husband, whom the legitimate wife is afraid of being displaced by, implies the relationship of the younger Lilith as the slave or handmaiden of the elder. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So there you go. Absolutely another tie-over to the Bible here. But let's continue on, and we're going to wrap it up. Lilith, the maiden, is said to be the consort of the demon Asmodeus. Her mother is purportedly a demoness named Mehetabal, meaning something immersed, which brings to mind the meaning of Baphomet's name, according to Hammer Pergstall, baptism of wisdom. The Zohar says that Lilith, the maiden, incarnated in human form as Nema, the daughter of the Cain's descendant Lamech, who accidentally killed Cain. Thus, the race of Lilith's human descendants are sometimes referred to by Kabbalists as the sons of Nema. The Zohar further tells us that it was originally Nema who first seduced the angels, or sons of God, referred to in Genesis chapter 6, causing them to lust after human females and incur God's wrath. Lilith the maiden, also known as Nema, also allegedly incarnated as Moses' Egyptian wife, Zipporah. Both Liliths were said to have taken form as the two prostitutes which approached King Solomon to judge in their dispute over the parentage of a young child, for which he famously ruled that the child should be cut in half and shared between them. Others see Lilith and Nema as just two of a quartet of concubines for Samael. According to Kabbalist Nathan Nodapora, quote, Samael was given four kingdoms, and in each of them he has a concubine. The names of his concubines are Lilith, whom he took as his consort, and she is the first one. The second is Nema, the third, even Maskit, and the fourth, Igrat, daughter of Maholoth. And the four kingdoms are, first, the kingdom of Damascus, in which is found the house of Rimon, the second, the kingdom of Tyre, which is opposite of the land of Israel. The third, the kingdom of Malta, which formerly was called Rhodos. And the fourth, the kingdom called Granada. And some say that it is the kingdom of Ishmael. And in each of these four kingdoms dwells one of the four aforementioned concubines. End quote. These four concubines are taken by other authors to be separate incarnations or emanations of the same goddess Lilith, Besides Nema and Lilith, the names of the other concubines vary according to the source. The above quoted source names them as Ivan Maskit and Igrat. Other names that have been listed include Mahalath and Nega. 
They appear to be demons like Lilith, but some of them also specifically correspond to women mentioned in the Bible. Mahalath is the daughter of Abraham's son Ishmael, who was sire, whom what he sired by the daughter of Kazdiel, the Egyptian sorcerer. Ishmael's father disapproved of the marriage and successfully pressured him into divorcing her before the baby was born. Mahalath, who is also known as Bashemoth, interestingly enough, is said to have performed sorceries in the desert with her mother, evoking a spirit named Igratiel, who had sex with Mahalath and conceived a daughter named Igrat. Mahalath later married Esau, the son of Isaac and brother of Jacob. Esau was the first of the kings of Edom. So I'm going to pause right here, folks. So we see here how all these things tie into the biblical histor historical account as well with this. And we didn't even get to the bulk of of what some of the importance is as we get forward in time here. But we're beginning to see this is the lineage of Cain when you look at this. And this is who they tie themselves back to, these people in positions of power today. You see how they meticulously trace the roots of this stuff? And this is taught in the secret schools. They're taught this stuff. We're not. These people who claim to have this royal lineage, these old family bloodlines, These are this is what they're taught. They're taught that their lineage ties back to these mythical beings, these godlike beings, these reptilian beings. So therefore, therefore, in a sense, David Icke was right. <laughs> so, uh, when, when you look at that stuff and understand it all ties back to these occult ties and these Gnostic viewpoints, then you have a clearer view. I think we're going to continue into this series here because this is all fascinating stuff, for sure, tying back the roots of this. Now, it's one thing for me to tell you that these people... They believe that they are of the line of Cain, and that gives them the, the divine right to rule. But it's another thing altogether to actually make all of these specific points and connections for you so that you can determine that for yourself. You can look at this stuff yourself, do the research for yourself. You'll find this is absolutely what they do believe. And you don't have to take my word for it. In fact, I would encourage you, don't take my word for it. Go look yourself. Don't believe anything I'm telling you. Go verify it for yourself. That's why I take the time to do the things I do here. And I give it this to you in their own words. These are their beliefs in their own words. That's why I find these texts and stuff that I do and relate them to you. It's not me saying this. This is coming directly from them, from the people, from the sources who claim to know. This is what they believe. So when you understand that, you know what they believe, why they act the way they do, and the methods that they use, then you could better arm yourself against those psychological attacks that they have coming your way, the archetypes they leverage against you. When you understand just how deep this stuff runs, then you understand we are truly truly in a spiritual battle. It is spiritual warfare at the highest levels, folks. Get your hearts and your minds right with God. We're living in interesting times, for sure. Anyway, I hope this was informative. We will continue this series in the future here. I appreciate each and every one of you. Have a good night now. Discover the amazing, clinically proven health benefits of Original Tahitian Noni. Original Tahitian Noni includes powerful antioxidants, adaptogens, nutrients, and phytonutrients to naturally boost energy levels, immune system function, and overall health. Meticulously sourced from French Polynesia, this is the original superfruit, except no imitations. Original Tahitian Noni. Visit ATR Health at alchemicaltechrevolution.com. 
and click on the Shop Here tab for more details. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex.